Good day, everyone. So for our topic today, it is entitled Glassware, Plasticware, and Measuring Vessels. Selecting laboratory wear can become a task in itself, especially when you are not aware of different available alternatives. It's essential to select the right bottles, flasks, jars, beakers, and accessories to support your research, laboratory activities, etc. Some laboratories require the inert, uh, heat-resistant and customizable qualities of that uh, laboratory glassware provides, while others prefer the price and durability of plastic wear. So this topic outlines the factors which help in deciding your choice of laboratory wear materials. For the learning objectives of this topic, at the end of the session, each one of you will be able to differentiate the importance of glasswares and plastic wares, compare and contrast the different categories or types of glassware used in the clinical laboratory, enumerate the measuring vessels used in clinical chemistry laboratory, and lastly is to classify pipettes based on specific criteria. As for the references or the study guide for our Clinical Chemistry 1 laboratory, so you can use any of the following. So Clinical Chemistry by Bishop, 6th or 7th edition. And then for uh, another reference, we have Laboratory Principles by TH, 7th edition. And lastly is our Henry for our overall uh, reference guide. Now let's proceed to the laboratory glassware and plasticware. So why do we use glassware or plasticwares in the laboratory? So first is for storage because we have a lot of liquids in the laboratory so we need some glasswares or plasticwares in order for us to store. The next one is for measurement. Uh, accuracy and precision is really important in the chemistry laboratory so we need them in order to have an accurate or a precise measurement. And lastly is of course for containment. Okay. So next let's discuss plasticware. So glasswares and your plasticwares have different advantages and disadvantages. So let's tackle first about plasticwares. So plasticware in the laboratory is reusable and can be autoclaved. So they're lightweight, uh, which is better for ergonomics. So they can be recycled and are environmentally friendly. So they're a bit more cost effective than glass. So which is a huge plus for many laboratories and are more convenient since they can be disposed of after every use. Plasticware is better for safety too since plastic materials are non-breakable and flexible. Plasticware, uh, plasticware's clarity is not nearly as good as uh, when compared to the glass, so they are also affected more by high temperatures, and graduation marks are not as clear, which might lead to inaccurate results while testing. So plasticware, uh, testing for heavy metals is recommended, so there should be no glasswares used for testing heavy metals. Why? Because in the glass substrate, uh, there is... Uh, the presence of the lead, the cadmium, and chromium, which can uh, cause uh, erroneous results. Okay, so some of the advantages and disadvantages are already flashed on our screen. Now let's proceed to the glasswares. So glass beakers can be heated into the hot plates without breaking or melting. Glassware is also easier to clean and can be reused quite frequently. Improved transparency of glass offers enhanced visibility of graduation marks no, as compared to our plastic wares for accurate readings. Glassware also provides improved chemical resistance against acids and any alkaline solutions. There are also some disadvantages of glassware in your laboratory. There is a higher chance of breaking which might result in a sample loss and exposure to any harmful solutions, which can create an unsafe laboratory environment. So glass containers can't be used to hold hydrofluoric acid. Glassware is also not disposable after each use and you will have to be autoclaved or cleaned frequently. So glasswares must be evaluated for conformance uh, and can be calibrated by NIST. So when we talk about NIST, this is a National uh, Institute of Standards and Technology. Okay, so according to NIST, uh, NIST Class A glasswares has the highest level of accuracy out of all the different types of glassware. So when we talk about Class A glassware, this type of glassware is manufactured from borosilicate material, which gives it superior properties over other types of your glasswares. Class A borosilicate glassware has superior thermal and chemical resistance properties, which are helpful when working with chemicals common in the laboratory experiments. Class B glassware, glassware is not as accurate as Class A, and Class B requires more frequent calibration sessions. However, due to its more multi-purpose use, Class B glassware is a cheaper and a more affordable option. So now let's proceed to the cleaning of plastic or glassware. So since glassware are not disposable, no, so you really need to clean it. So those in direct contact with biohazard material is usually disposable. If not disposable, follow proper 
the contamination protocol. So here it is. So immediate rinsing and then washing with powder or liquid detergent. So that is why liquid detergent uh, should be a requirement to your group. And then pre-soaking in soapy water. But you can read more further on this one uh, with our reference bishop chapter 1. Okay. Now let's go on with the further details about plastic wares. So the primary functions of the resin are to transfer stress between the reinforcing fibers. Resin act as a glue to hold the fibers together and protect the fibers from mechanical and environmental damage. So resins used in reinforced polymer composites are either thermoplastic or thermoset. So presented in your screen are the major types of resins used in clinical chemistry laboratories. So we have polystyrene, polyethylene, polypropylene, teflon, and polycarbonate. Before going on with that, uh, further details. So let's have the guide to the numbers. No, so as what we have mentioned earlier, that plastic ware uh, mostly in the laboratory are made up of resin. And these numbers here now presented on your screen. So a product made of plastic is often stamped with a resin code. So which is a number between one and seven inside a small triangle made of arrows. So the presence of a resin code doesn't necessarily mean that the product can be recycled. So it's the number inside the triangle that counts because each number corresponds to a different type of plastic. So please take note that the most toxic plastics are numbers 3, 6, and 7. While those that may be somewhat safer includes number, uh, include numbers 1, 2, 4, and 5. Okay, please take note of that. And the number uh, is a resin identification code that tells you what kind of plastic that material is made of. So let's say for instance for uh, code number 1, we have PET or PET. So it is made up of polyethylene, tetra, terephthalate. Okay, so on and so forth. All right. So please don't get confused with regards to the uh, code numbers. Right. So now let's discuss uh, into detail uh, about polystyrene. Okay. So the characteristics are presented on your screen already. So as well as the disadvantage of using this type of plastic ware. So styrofoam products are made out of uh, polystyrene plastic, so it's commonly used to make disposable coffee cups, uh, packing peanuts, coolers, and to-go food containers. So your polystyrene products can sometimes be recycled, so not all the time, okay? Some of its other uses are already presented on the screen. So here's a picture of an example of our polystyrene, okay? So next, we have polypropylene. So polypropylene is used to make the food containers uh, used for products like yogurt, sour cream, and margarine. It's also made into straws, uh, rope, carpet, and bottle cups. So your polypropylene can sometimes be recycled. The same with your polystyrene. Okay, so some other characteristics are already presented on your screen. All right. So other uses of your polypropylene so it is for cryogenic procedures okay so cryogenic so it involves in your histopath no so it involves the presence of the liquid nitrogen so it is specially formulated to withstand uh, temperature down to negative 190 degree celsius okay so here are your polypropylene products so next we have your polyethylene so there's a good chance you held something made of this plastic type today. So the PET or the PET no, is what's used to make bottles for soda, water, and other drinks. Uh, it's also used to make cooking oil containers, plastic peanut butter jars, and containers for other popular food items. No? Polyethylene may bind or absorb proteins, dye, stains, and picric acid. Uh, the same with what we have presented on our screen. No? As you can see, our PET has uh, stains. No, So when you are going to use it for those food that... Uh, have really rich in oil okay or that have stains okay uh, disadvantage of using this one no is that it is not uh, autoclavable no because this type of plastic can be melted okay but please take note that your pet or your peat products no can be recycled okay so next uh, we have the following examples for our polyethylene products all right so next, we have our polycarbonate. Polycarbonate is a very strong plastic, but uh, it is not suitable for use with strong acids, bases, and oxidizing agents, no? Because it will destroy our plastic. So for limitations, uh, we need to refer to the manufacturer's instructions. Okay, so because uh, this type of plastic has its own limitations depending on the manufacturer. Okay, example of our polycarbonate product. So that one. 
Next, we have our Teflon. Teflon is a tough uh, insoluble polymer used in making non-sticking coatings. Let's say, for instance, for cookware, in gaskets, uh, bearings, electrical insulators, etc. So, other examples are already presented on your screen. So, we have our uh, steering magnet, uh, magnet steerer. We also have our uh, cups, okay, disposable cups. So, our characteristics, it is already uh, presented in our screen. So, other examples, so we have this one, a frying pan coated with a Teflon. So, uh, that's what makes it non-sticky. And this one, the gasket or the uh, Teflon that is used to uh, seal your water faucets, okay? So, the next one, you now we have the general categories of glass. So, glass wares in the form of beakers, petri dishes, vials, uh, burettes, and si cylinders, among others, has always been a part of even the smallest laboratories. So, this is because of the unique inert qualities that allow chemical substances to be placed inside it. However, uh, not all glassware is equal. So, there are different materials used in making laboratory glass such as quartz, uh, soda lime, borosilicate, and actinic among others. So, here are the few of the more common glass types used in the laboratory. So, we have borosilicate, we have high silica glass, aluminosilicate, acid and alkali resistant, low actinic, flint glass, and as well as disposable glassware. Now, let's proceed to your borosilicate glass. So, this is among the most common type of glass found in laboratories and is used in beakers, vials, test tubes, flasks, uh, etc. This material has a low expansion that makes it suitable for a wide variety of laboratory applications. It has a high resistance to uh, chemical attacks and a very low coefficient of expansion. However, there are some substances that this glass material is not inert to. Okay? So, here are the different characteristics of our uh, borosilicate class. So, thermal expansion, when we talk about it, uh, it is the tendency of matter to change in shape, area, and volume in response to a change in temperature. While the low coefficient of expansion, on the other hand, allows manufacturing it with heavy walls giving it mechanical strength while retaining a reasonable heat resistance. And then, precautions regarding alkalis, uh, it will be discussed later, okay? So, one of the uses, primary uses of our borosilicate glass is for heating. So, we can use it on open flame or electric heating material elements, okay? So, one example of uh, borosilicate glass is, product is our uh, Erlenmeyer flask, okay? So, precautions for heating uh, will be presented on the next slide. So, here are the precautions. So, please, uh, storing of concentrated alkali solutions will etch or destroy the calibration. So, this will hinder your uh, laboratory uh, measurements okay so heavy wall type of glass should not be heated with direct flame or hot plate because it will destroy your glass and lastly is to avoid heating beyond its strain point when we talk about strain point uh, it is defined as a temperature at which a certain glass viscosity is reached it is that point at which all movement of the glass molecules has reached a point where no more strain can be introduced into the hot glass so glass should not be heated above its strain point because um, rapid cooling strains and cracks the glass easily when it is heated again. Okay, please take note of that. So in the case of volumetric glassware, heating can destroy the calibration. Okay. So we have the popular brands no, of our borosilicate glass. We have Pyrex. So the strain point is about 515 degrees Celsius according to our reference book, Henry. We also have the Kimax or Kimax. So the strain point is 513 degrees Celsius. Okay. Next uh, category of our glass is our high silica glass, okay? So, silica glass is another name for labware uh, made from this material, okay? There are among the most uncompromising equipment found in a laboratory. They are created at high temperatures of 2000 degrees Celsius by melting sand, okay? This is normally transparent with superior thermal and optical properties. If you are conducting experiments with wide temperature differences, then this is the ideal glass for you. It has a low coefficient of thermal expansion, which makes it very suitable to be used in any temperature. So there is a wide range of laboratory wear available in this material, including joints, tubes, flasks, beakers, cuvettes, and crucibles. So one uh, most common usage of our high silica glass, no, often fused with quartz, no, is our spectrophotometer cuvettes, no, as you can see in the picture. And we will be using this one when we are going to perform uh, spectrophotometry, so later on with our uh, experiments. Okay? The next type we have is our alumina silicate glass, so also known as your alumino silicate glass. So it contains aluminum oxide. So, one of its uh, advantages is, is that uh, it is strengthened with chemically uh, rather than thermally, okay? 
So which means it has greater chemical durability and can withstand higher operating temperatures. Okay. So for our uh, aluminum silicate glass, so they can also be used uh, in the production of resistors in which resistors are used to reduce current flow adjust signal levels, uh, divide voltages, bias active elements, and terminate transmission lines, so among other uses. Okay, so that is why it is when coated with an electric electrically conductive film, so aluminum silicate glass is used, for resist used as resistors for electronic circuitry. Okay, but remember that your glass is not a conductor of electricity. Okay, so next we have our uh, corex, no? So according to Henry, the characteristics of this type of glass no, is it is radiation resistant, six times stronger than borosilicate glass, and it resists clouding and scratching better. So this is somehow a uh, scratch resistant type of glass. Okay, But please take note that this is not used as a general type of glassware in the laboratory. Okay, So uses is already flashed on our screen. Okay, So this corex or the corning no, is one of the uh, component no, in making our uh, devices such as in uh, Apple products, no, in iPhone or in iPads. Okay, so it is composed of alkali, aluminum silicate, sheet glass. Okay. So the next one we have our acid resistant and alkali resistant glass. So they are boron free. So acid resistant and alkali resistant glass is also known as your soft glass. So the thermal resistance in this type of glass is much less than that of the borosilicate glass. So it must be heated and cooled very carefully, not to avoid damages or cracks. Okay. So we have this uh, common brand, the Vicor. So it is made up of fused silica. So it is two in one in its characteristics because uh, this is heat resistant and chemically inert. Okay. When we talk about chemically inert, uh, it is used to describe a substance that is not chemically reactive. Okay. So unique characteristics. It is already presented on our screen. Okay. So please take note that uh, hydrofluoric acid no, uh, is uh, really harmful to this type of glass because it will attack or corrode uh, glasses no, with silica. Okay, And then it is safe to assume class that uh, it also has the same effect with high silica glass and others. So please avoid uh, hydrofluoric acids okay, or any types of hydrofluoric acid when you are using uh, different categories of our glasswares or our glass. Okay. So other uh, characteristics, it can withstand high temperature up to 1,200 degrees Celsius. Remember, uh, if it reaches 1,500 degrees Celsius, your glass will already uh, start to soften, okay? As this is the softening temperature of our acid-resistant al alkali-resistant glass. So usage usually is for ashing and ignition techniques, okay? Does the name, class no, does the name na soft glass, okay? So please be careful of this uh, softening temperature, okay? The next one we have is our low actinic glass. So low actinic glass contains material that usually impart amber to red color to the glass. So the density of the red color is adjusted glass in order to permit adequate visibility of the contents, no? Yet give maximum protection to light sensitive materials. Okay? So this red colored glass, no, will really give a maximum protection to those light sensitive uh, uh, materials or reagents, okay? So there is some glass equipment that is tinted dark brown or amber, no? thus the term amber bottles. So these can be created from any material and are named after the color. So this is done to protect light-sensitive chemical compounds no? from getting altered by infrared radiation, visible light, and ultraviolet radiation. So amber glass is ideal for light-sensitive applications. So it is presented in our screen, so on the left part, no? amber glass. Generally, it is tinted glass uh, used only in bottles to store chemicals in solution or in powder form. So these were the rage in older times when apothecaries were common. Okay. So next we have uh, the commonly uh, usage of our low actinic glasses of our light sensitive substances as what we have mentioned earlier. No, specifically our bilirubin and our vitamin A substances. Okay. So next we have our soda lime glass. So this glass is extremely fragile and has a low melting point. Okay, so thus, it is also known as your flint glass. So it is almost impossible to repair and does not have high thermal shock resistance. So you might wonder about the functionality of this ordinary glass in laboratories. So the answer lies in its affordability. 
So it is a lower cost and can be easily made. So hence, it is used for the laboratory equipment that is required in abundance such as our pipettes, our measuring cylinders, disposable test tubes, and volumetric flasks. Okay? So please take note that this is the most inexpensive glass no? because it is readily made into a variety of types of glassware. So it, examples are already presented on our screen. So you can see up there. So wine glass, pitcher glass, etc. Okay? Composition, it consists of soda or sodium oxide and as well as lime or calcium oxide. So, soda lime glass has a high expansion coefficient and a high degree of thermal resistance. Okay? So, when we talk about high thermal expansion, it means that it is easy to melt. Okay? But the problem is the minerals. No? Because minerals class, when you are going to analyze it and place it in a soda lime glass, it can be leached from the glass into the stored solution. So, it can cause contamination. No? So, please be careful of using soda lime glasses or not use this at all. Okay? Commonly usage, uh, we have volumetric flask, steering rods, single-use pipettes, or test tubes. Okay? Now, let's proceed to our next topic. So, we have the measuring vessels. So, in a well-equipped laboratory, a diverse range of specialized glassware stands ready to gauge, transfer, and retain various liquids. So, from slender pipettes handling minuscule quantities to capacious beakers accommodating larger volumes, each vessel fulfills a distinct purpose, crafted from robust uh, borosilicate glass. So, this labware proves highly resilient, engineered to endure both chemical reactions and high temperature conditions. So, the precision of markings on laboratory glassware varies according to the type of container. Beakers and flasks designed for tasks where exact measurements matter less typically feature a margin of error of approximately plus minus 5% relative to their total volume. So, graduated cylinders, conversely, maintain a narrower tolerance of about 1%. Okay? So, here are the common measuring vessels used in the laboratory. We have graduated cylinder, burettes, volumetric flask, and pipette. So, now let's discuss first about graduating cylinders. So, due to the degree of error that is present, no, so graduated cylinders is semi-accurate. No? Um, in an article that I read uh, for class B glasswares, uh, the error when measuring volume halfway up is at maximum of 1% and this increases as we measure volumes below the halfway mark. Okay? So, your graduated cylinder should never be heated, especially if it contains plastic because it will destroy the calibration. So, similar to beakers, graduated cylinders are tall, cylindrical containers with a spout, of pour, uh, spout for pouring, so presented on our picture. So, they have hash marks or graduations on the side to measure the volume of a liquid. Most laboratories have graduated cylinders in a variety of sizes. So, typical volume measurements or the... Uh, Different calibration, so it is marked in milliliters. Uh, we have 10 ml, 25 ml, 50 ml, 100 ml, 500 ml, and as well as 1000 ml. Okay, so next we have our burettes. Okay, burettes are long, narrow glass tubes with hash marks or graduation marks for measurement along the side. So they have one tapered end to deliver precise liquid measurements and a stopcock. When we talk about stopcock, uh, it is a rubber stopper no, used to control the flow of liquid in titrations. So the stopcock can be turned to allow small amounts of liquid to flow out of the tube. Burettes are commonly used to measure precise variable volumes of solution, primarily for titration. I know that you already have done this one no, during your phenoptalin titration during your lower years and mixing a known measurement of one react uh, reactant until the precise reaction is achieved. Okay. So, please take note that your burettes now have a volumetric graduation uh, etched permanently on its full length and a precision top or a stopcock on the bottom part. Okay? So, your burettes class are made up of PTFE or polytetrafluoroethylene rubber. Okay? Depending on the liquid to be carried. So, burettes class are uh, extremely accurate no, and have a very small accuracy tolerance. So, it is used to dispense known amounts of liquid reagent in experiments for which such precision is necessary. So, as what I have mentioned earlier, titration, no? such as in vol uh, volumetric analysis, okay? or uh, more specifically speaking, titration. Okay? So, next we have our volumetric flask. So, volumetric flask, when we describe it, uh, it is a, has a round lower portion with a flat bottom and a long thin neck with an etched calibration line. Calibrated to hold one exact volume of a liquid. So please take note that when the lower meniscus is near the calibration line, a pipette should be used when adding the final drops to ensure that the calibration line is not missed. Okay? So next one, last for our measuring vessels, we have the pipettes. Pipettes are measuring devices used to deliver liquids in tiny amounts. Uh, they are long, narrow glass tubes with tapered ends and a bulb in the center. So they have a hash mark to indicate when they are full. And then scientists... 
uh, use a small rubber bag to draw liquid into the tube and transfer it to another container or a mixture. But this is not applicable to our automated or automatic pipettes. Okay, so this is only applicable to our zero logic and volumetric pipettes no? when you are going to use a rubber bag. So, moving on with our discussion regarding pipettes. So, our pipettes has graduation line. Okay, so those are uh, marks, no? In order for you to have an exact or a precise uh, measurement of the liquid. So, we have meniscus. So, look on figure A class. So, meniscus is brought above the desired graduation line. So, meniscus is uh, the somewhat the curved portion of the liquid, no? Of the solution that is inside our pipette. And then on figure B, the liquid is allowed to drain until the bottom of the meniscus touches the desired calibration mark. So this is what we call uh, measuring no uh, l on the lower meniscus. Okay, but uh, if the curved portion of the liquid no is um, above nine, so it is uh, uh, what we call uh, on the upper meniscus. Okay. So division. Uh, when we talk about division class, no. Uh, on the upper part of the picture, 1 over 10 major division. When we talk about division, it means the interval of the marks. So meaning the small graduation marks on our pipette is 1 over 10. So it is measured as 1. So 5 in there, uh, it says the total volume. Okay, 5 in 1 over 10. Okay. So next, uh, pipettes are classified based on, according to Bishop, no design, drainage characteristics, and type. So when we talk about design, uh, uh, we have two types of uh, pipettes according to design. We have to contain and to deliver. Drainage characteristics, we have blowout and self-draining pipettes. And lastly, according to type, we have measuring and transfer pipettes. So we will discuss this one one by one. So as what mentioned earlier, no design to contain or to deliver. Drainage characteristics, blowout or self-draining. Type, we have measuring. We have the following examples. Serologic pipettes, more pipettes, bacteriologic pipettes, ball, colmer, or can pipettes, and as well as micro pipettes. For transfer pipettes, we have the following examples. Volumetric, oswald folin pasture pipettes, and automatic macro pipettes or micro pipettes. Now let us have to contain pipettes. So, to contain pipettes are also known as rinsed out pipettes. So, to contain, it must be refilled and rinsed out with the appropriate solvent after the initial liquid has been drained from the pipette. So, um, there is a tendency of the fluid to cling to the inner walls of the pipette. So, it is one of the disadvantages of using this to contain pipettes. So, examples, uh, we have Sally hemoglobin pipettes. Uh, I guess you have not used this one since you do not have a hematology subject yet. We also have long le levy pipettes. So, one common example of this one is the mercury uh, uh, found on our sphygmo manometers. So, this is a to-contain pipette. We also have our white blood cell and red blood cell pipettes or the WBC and RBC pipettes. So, this will be used uh, when you have your hematology laboratory subject. Okay. So, we also have the to-deliver pipette. So, the tip is placed against the side of the container except in more no, and serologic pipette. So to deliver pipette, literally they are designed no, to drain by gravity. So there is no need for you to use a small uh, bulb in order to blow out the remaining contents no, of the pipette. So from the word itself to deliver, so it is self-draining. So it will automatically drain the contents of the pipette out of it. Okay. So please take note of this one class. It to contain pipette holds or contains a particular volume but does not dispense the exact volume. But whereas a to-deliver pipette will dispense the volume indicated. So that's the difference between the two. Okay. So if volume is very crucial, then use a to-deliver pipette. Okay. Do not use a to-contain pipette. No, since uh, to contain pipette does not really uh, dispense the precise volume of the liquid. No. So please take note of that. Now let's proceed to pipettes according to drainage. So we have self-draining pipette. So self-draining pipette has a single painted at the top. Uh, it is presented on this picture. Can you see the orange mark right there? So when you see a self-draining uh, pipette, it has an orange painted, that one in the arrow class. Okay? So it allows to drain by gravity. Okay? So the same with your to-deliver class. No? So it has no frost or etched or double lines. So when you see uh, like that on the picture, an orange one, so it is a self-draining pipette. So there is no need for you to blow it out using a bulb. Okay? So the next one, we have our blown out pipettes. So, blown out pipettes has double rings or frost etch, okay? You can see on the bottom of our picture class, it has double rings. So, double rings. So, it has it's indicated in a blue marking. So, two colored rings. And the other one class, it has an etched ring. So, aside from the orange part, no, orange painted uh, mark, it has an 
uh, it has an etched ring, the one that is on the upper portion of our picture. It has a white etched ring. So the orange part and then a white etched ring. So it means that uh, you really need to use no a rubber bulb no or a pipette bulb or a similar device no in order for you to push uh, the remaining contents of the liquid no via the help of our air. Okay, so that is why they are known as your blow out or blown out pipettes. Okay, please take note of that. So here are the differences, class, no, between a self-draining and a blown-out pipette. So for the self-draining, you can see that there is no etch or color ring, so just the orange mark. Well, on the right portion of our picture, so it has an etch ring, so the upper picture has a white etch ring, and then on the lower portion of the picture, it has two color rings, so that is a blown-out pipette. Okay, please do not be confused. And then for the tip portion, class, of the self-draining and blown-out pipette, as you can see, the tip portion of a self-draining pipette, uh, has no uh, graduation uh, on the tip so it's on the right portion of this picture so uh, for the uh, sorry class it's for the self-draining it's on the left part but for the blown out pipette it has a uh, graduation up to the tip so you need to blow it out no? so you need a rubber bulb or other devices that will allow air to enter our pipette no? to blow it out the remaining contents of the liquid okay again the tip portion of the self-draining pipette is on the left side it has no graduated uh, no graduations to the tip. Well, the blown out no has graduations until the tip of our pipette. Please take note of that. Next, we have our according to type. So we have the transfer and the measuring or the graduated pipette. For the transfer pipettes, we have volumetric Oswald Follin, Pasture, Automatic Macro, and Micro Pipette. For the measuring, we have Serologic, More, and Micro Pipette. So for Automatic and Micro Pipettes class, uh, we'll not discuss them as a type, but as a sip, uh, but as a separate topic. Okay. So. Let's uh, discuss first about volumetric or transfer pipettes. So volumetric, so please take note that volumetric pipettes or transfer pipettes are self-draining as always, okay? So it means that you don't need to blow it out using a rubber bulb, okay? So volumetric or transfer pipette, so does the name suggest, no? It is used to measure and transfer a predetermined volume of liquid, okay? So it dis you can dispense one volume without further subdivision. So we have Oswald Follin pipette and Pasture pipette. So Oswald Follin pipette, no, uh, the distinguishing feature of this pipette, it has a bulb-like enlargement in the stem. No, it differentiates Oswald Follin pipette no, from other volumetric subgroups, no, which are used for viscous fluids or blowout uh, pipettes. So for the pasture pipette class, so it is not for quantitative analytic techniques, but you can use it no, to transfer fluids using uh, this pipette without considering a specific volume. Okay. So the next one, so we have the differences between our uh, pasture pipette no, on the upper part and the volumetric and the Oswald Follin pipette on the lower part of this uh, presentation. So we have disposable pasture pipettes so on the left upper part of the picture. Then we have the glass tie pasture pipette on the upper right portion of this picture. Volumetric pipettes so or transfer pipettes, so it's on the lower left portion of this presentation. And Oswald Follin pipette, it's on the lower right portion of this presentation. You can see the uh, enlargement of the bulb no, of our Oswald Follin pipette, so which makes it unique. No? So you can identify it as a as an Oswald Follin pipette because of the uh, large enlargement no, of the bulb. Okay. So in this figure, it just shows the correct and incorrect pipette position. So on the upper picture, you really have to position your pipette no, in an upright position or vertically, not horizontally and not on a tilting position. Okay. Uh, in case of volumetric or Oswald Follin pipette, no, uh, you can tilt it slightly, but not too much. No, but you can tilt the uh, solution or the liquid that you are going to uh, to contain. Okay. So please take note of that class. So the volumetric pipettes class are always self-draining, as what I have mentioned earlier. So Oswald Follin pipettes are blowout pipettes. So Oswald Follin it's on the figure B. Volumetric pipettes are on figure A. So that's self-draining. Okay. Again, uh, I will repeat it over and over. So the bulb-like enlargement uh, of the pipette stem no, it will easily distinguish Oswald Follin pipette and a volumetric pipette. Okay. So next, we have the measuring or the graduated pipettes. So Literally, they are used to calibrate no, or distribute fractional quantity of liquid and they are principally used for measurements of reagents. Examples, we have the Moore pipette and the serologic pipette. Now, let's tackle about Moore pipette. So, to differentiate between a Moore pipette and a serologic pipette, Moore pipette has no graduations to the tip. So, it's in the left picture. And serologic pipette class has graduations up to the tip. So, that's on the right picture. And Moore pipette class no, starts from 0 to 10. 
while your serologic pipette clot starts from 10 to 1 no, in terms of the volume uh, calibration. So please take note of that, that they are inversely proportional. And please take note that your serologic pipette is a blowout pipette. So as you can see on the picture on the right, it has two etched rings, okay? And you need a rubber bulb in order for air to enter no, inside the pipette to blow the remaining contents no, because it is not self-draining, okay? So the next one that we have is our micropipette. So micropipette, uh, literally no from the term micro, so meaning it contains liquid no, or it can hold volume less than 1 ml. While, micro, uh, while macropipette on the other hand class, it contains or holds uh, volume larger than 1 ml. So that's the difference between micropipette and a macropipette, okay? So according to Bishop class, uh, automatic pipettes are under transfer pipettes. But there are uh, the distinction of automatic pipettes and transfer pipettes overlaps. So your automatic pipettes class dispense one volume without subdivisions no, like a transfer pipette. But they can dispense several different volumes like a measuring pipette. Okay, That is why automatic pipettes are under transfer pipettes. So next we have uh, two types of micro pipette. We have air displacement and a positive displacement. So both of uh, this one class, air displacement and positive displacement, are piston operated. But uh, air displacement class, the piston does not come in contact with the liquid. While on the other hand, uh, positive displacement, no, the piston comes in contact with the liquid. So that's why uh, there is really uh, carryover concerns no, uh, with regards to using your positive displacement pi uh, micro pipette. So, for the differences, other differences, it is already presented on our screen. So, this one class right here no, is a uh, picture no, of our positive displacement pipette. So, this type of pipette class is useful if a reagent reacts to plastics. Okay. So, in order for you to uh, be acquainted with this kind of micropipette, so you can watch the link uh, flashed on the screen. Okay. So the next one, we have the different parts of our uh, positive displacement pipette. So you just have to become familiarized with the different parts of this one. Okay, so it is already presented on our screen. So this one, uh, it is our uh, two types of our pipetting concepts no, or, or our micro pipette. So the air displacement, no, it's on the right and on the, uh, I mean on the left and on the right class no, is our positive displacement. Okay, so the air displacement pipette is on the left and then the positive displacement pipette is on the right. Okay, so that's the difference. So the piston, uh, that's what I'm talking about no, for the positive displacement pipette. As you can see on the picture, the light blue color, no, it comes into contact with the liquid. So that is why it is more prone to contamination. Unlike with the uh, air displacement pipette, the piston does not come in contact with the liquid. As you can see on the left portion of the piston, so the distance is somewhat... Uh, uh, not near no to the liquid or to our substance or to our analyte of interest okay so just a closer look no between the uh, difference between air displacement pipette and a positive displacement pipette so unprotected airspace on the air displacement pipette is prone to vapor contamination and then uh, aerosol contamination but on the positive displacement pipette you can see that there are no aerosol contamination and no vapor contamination because it really is uh, the the piston itself no comes into contact with the liquid but the disadvantage is the carryover no of the uh, or the con cross contamination of the sample and then the uh, the piston itself okay so the next one we have the different parts of our uh, micro pipette so we have the plunger the plunger is this is the part where we operate to displace the liquid. We also have the tip ejector button. So it is pressed to eject the pipette tip, literally. And then the tip ejector, it does the actual ejecting of the pipette tip. Then the thumb wheel class, it will allow us to set the volume of the liquid to be displaced. And then the volume meter display, it shows the user the volume he or she has to set to be displaced. And then we also have the shaft and as well as the disposable tip. Okay, The shaft it is where the disposable tip is connected. Okay. So, this is just a concept class no, of uh, the difference between air displacement pipette and the positive displacement pipette. So, we have uh, for the air displacement pipette, so you can uh, uh, ready your thumb no, or your finger and then you press the first stop and then you uh, release your thumb and then on the third step class, you're going to press the first and the second stop in order for you to dispense the 
uh, liquid or the sample. And then lastly is to release it. That's why on number four. Okay. We'll just uh, further demonstrate this one no, on our next meeting in order for you to understand this one better on an actual uh, setting. Okay. But in order for you to uh, to observe on how properly operate an air displacement pipette, so you can watch this link presented. Okay. And then for our last topic class, we have the semi-automate, uh, semi-automatic and automatic pipettes and dispensers. So you can read this one further on the reference guide by Tietz. Okay. So dispensers or dilutors obtained uh, liquid from a common reservoir and can dispense repeatedly. So they can be a bottle top. So just like on the picture on the left side portion of our screen. And then they can be motorized or handheld or attached to a dilutor such as a picture on the right. Okay. So if... There is a pipette class no, that is uh, attached on a bottle top. So this one usually is used in blood banking no, for dispensing a normal saline solution. Okay, And that ends our topic for our uh, glasswares and plastic wares, everyone. So thank you so much for listening. So if you've got any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you so much and have a good day, everyone.